This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard to find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is Frank Murtaugh, sports columnist with the Memphis Flyer and managing editor of Memphis Magazine. Tonight, the Memphis Tigers are in Dallas to face off with Larry Brown and the SMU Mustangs. Including this evening's contest, the Tigers have 11 games remaining in the regular season before embarking on the American Conference Tournament in Orlando. Memphis picked up its first road win of the season this past Tuesday night at UCF, posting a blistering 97 points in the win. Ironically, that game came two days after one of the Tigers' worst losses in head coach Josh Pastner's seven years at the helm, falling to East Carolina at home, their first ever loss to the Pirates in the Bluff City. And it was that loss that seemed to ignite a firestorm from both media and fans alike, blasting the state of the program and pointing their finger at the head coach. Now, this was not the first time people have come out negatively towards Pastner. In fact, some fans have been calling for a coaching change for several years, particularly after last season's disappointment. So was Sunday's loss the breaking point or was it overreaction? But even if it's the former, can the administration afford to make a change when they still owe Josh over $10 million. And what if the Tigers make a run and win the AAC? They certainly have a chance to make a statement over the next week with SMU, UConn, and Cincinnati, the next three opponents on the schedule. Today, we look at the state of the Tigers with a man who has covered Memphis hoops and football since 2001, Memphis Flyer sports columnist Frank Murtaugh, who has also been the managing editor of Memphis Magazine for the last 20 years. Frank's From My Seat column and Tiger Blue blog at memphisflyer.com have provided readers with keen insight and opinion in the Tigers athletics. Today, it's Frank Murtaugh on Sports Files. It's a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks a lot for having me, Greg. It's a real honor to be here. It's you've, you've been covering the Tigers, football and basketball, since 2001. So you're certainly dialed into what's going on. Let me start with this, Frank. What do you think the general perception from Tigers fans is about the program? And then what do you think the national perception of the basketball program is? Well, you know, it's a good question these days. It, it's been a rocky season, as we know, up and down for – the last couple of years really under Josh Pastner. I, I think, you know, the perception in town is, you know, there's a standard that we hold to going all the way back to 1973 to the, the runs in the 1980s with Keith Lee and on up to John Calipari's last four years here. That's one standard and there's a view that the program should be there. And then there's the polar opposite that a lot of fans feel like, you know, we're just, we're dragging toward that and not making the necessary progress. Nationally, I think, um, you know, the, the Tiger program has fallen a bit, um, a bit off that, that radar of elite. And, um, you know, getting back on there is Josh Pastner's primary challenge. And uh, I think the question remains how patient are our fans and sponsors and advertisers and us media types going to be right, right. in getting back to that, to that status. What do you think the realistic expectations should be for this program any given year? Well, you want to compete for national championships. You know, the, the, uh, the run we had in 1973, 1985, 2008, those weren't accidents. You know, Memphis can, can put an elite basketball team on the floor. Um, I'm not of the mind they can do it every year. This is not a, a basketball factory like you see in Duke, uh, Kansas, North Carolina, Kentucky. We are not going to be that. Memphis cannot be that. But it can be in that tier of, of programs that, you know, is top 20, top 25, 
if not annually, regularly. And, you know, um, Josh and, and his staff, they've, they've fallen off that right now, and it's, it's going to be a chore to get back. Right. I was going to ask you, so is it alarming that Josh, who now is in his seventh year as the head coach of the Tigers, has not made it yet to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament? Yeah, yeah. I think that's, um, if there was a single sticking point that fans have, that's it. Uh, you know, you go back to 1997, almost 20 years ago, um, Larry Finch, I mean, the, the face of this institution, really, or this program, the Tiger basketball program, uh, was, was, you know, basically run out of town. And it was just two years after reaching the Sweet 16. Right. And here, Josh has not reached the, the second weekend of the tournament in his uh, going on seven years. Um, and that gets back to, you know, what's a fair standard, what's unfair. Mm -hmm. and, and Josh is fighting that. His, his players are fighting that. Um, fans, you know, particularly those that go back long enough to remember those glory days, are fighting that. And uh, it's, um, it, it's a compelling story. It's what, what keeps me interested. It's what keeps you following it. Um, it it's, it's never boring following this, the, the Tiger basketball program. Um, we just have to see. You know, there's a lot to be played yet this year. Frank, let me ask you this. You talked about the glory years, and there have been times throughout the last 40 years where we've had historical runs by Memphis basketball going back to the national championship run in the early 70s versus Walton and UCLA with Gene Bartow. And then, of course, what Larry Finch was able to do with Keith Lee, the star. You just mentioned Larry Finch making a great run in the NCAA tournament. Then came John Calipari. Are we spoiled as a fan base? And I'm not including myself, but obviously I, I root for the Tigers to do well, as you do, covering them. But have we become spoiled because of what Calipari was able to do? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this in the ride over. If you consider 1973, the, the run of the championship game, then those four straight years with Keith Lee to the Sweet 16, then the four years, uh, John's last four years here as head coach, that right. went to the Sweet 16, that's, that's nine total basketball seasons going to, to uh, you know, that elite strata of the NCAA tournament. Nine seasons, and they've been playing basketball since 1920. So... Fans tend to remember only those nine years or only those standards and not the, the, the gaps in between when you're getting to the NCAA tournament but maybe not getting as far. Uh, you know, Elliot Perry never played in the Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. Elliot Perry's number hangs from the rafters. He's as respected and admired a former Tiger as there is. He never played in the Sweet 16. But, you know, particularly those of us with short memories, you know, it only goes back, you know, seven years and, and John had that team in its fourth straight Sweet 16. That's, you know... That's what we're reaching for. That's what the program's reaching for. And um, it, it's not easy to get there. We, we kind of scoffed when, when Josh was a, a rookie coach here and would often say that winning is hard. You know what? It's hard. Winning is hard in college basketball. One of the worst words I can use for a fan base is apathy. Fans are happy at times, and they are upset at times. And that's fine because those things happen. There's up and ups and downs and swings. Right. We've had too much apathy over the last right. couple of years, Frank, when oh, all yeah. of a sudden the attendance has dropped the way it has dropped and people don't care. Right. It seems like it's blasphemous to hear that from the fan base of I, Tiger basketball. No doubt. You know, I, I've often thought that it would be better for Josh Pastner and better for the program if FedEx Forum is packed and everyone's booing. Everyone's upset. Right. You're not doing this the right way. You're not competing the right way. You're not making the right decisions on timeouts. Whatever the, the reasons for the... The, the angst and, and aggravation, but when those empty seats are staring at us on game nights and you know on and on Saturday nights, weekend nights, when that's that's the time that historically Tiger fans are out packing that arena, that's um, those empty seats scream really that they're not booing, but they scream at us in, in metaphorical ways that are damaging to the program. Barring a, a great run to get into the NCAA tournament, which is still possible, there's a long way to go, but let's just say it does not happen. Um, and I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you this question about whether or not Josh should lose his job after seven years, but some people, media members, have come out and they have suggested that it happens. Do you believe he is fighting for his job, trying to save his job, and then take into consideration, as you know, $10 million remaining on the contract, it puts the university into a tough situation. So what are your general thoughts on that? I, I think if the Tigers do not rally, if they do not you know, gel as a team and, and reach that second weekend of the NCAA tournament, something dramatic is going to happen in the offseason. Whether or not that, that means a coaching change, I'm not going to say or, or try and guess right now. Right. But something dramatic different 
something dramatically different will happen before we enter the 2016-17 season. You know, the Tom Bowen and his staff at the university, they're going to have to weigh that $10 million that they would have to pay Josh to leave versus how much money they might lose if he stays, you know, the next two, three years in terms of ticket sales, sponsorships, mm -hmm. ad revenue, all the different revenue streams that, you know, Mr. It Bowen, all plays a part. It, it does. And, and, and Tom Bowen's got to got to measure those metrics, you know, how many listeners are lost on, on radio broadcasts, TV broadcasts, if there's that apathy you're talking about. And that's, what, that's when it becomes a, you know, a, a, a P&L decision. If you're, you're a bean counter, you know, you know, profit versus that loss of $10 million, how does it balance and how do you make sure you're, you're losing the least and, and hopefully eventually making the most. You want it to be profitable. Frank, what would you say the number, in your opinion, the number one strength of Josh Pastner is and the number one weakness? They may be the same thing. And that is, an, uh, I don't mean this the wrong way, but it's a boyish optimism. And it is a, it is a belief that, that um, nice guys can finish first mm. and that, that wins are going to happen doing things the right way. And, and I, have, I happen to admire that 100% in Josh Pastner. And the critics who want to get on his case for being a, a goody two shoes or choosing to to ignore negative or emphasize positive uh, that's it's a cynical world we live in and and we need more Josh pastors along those lines now you know there are times when you're losing East Carolina at a home game on Sunday afternoon there is nothing positive there in front of four thousand people in front of four thousand people and you know, I you know i I've, I've never seen Josh look more deflated than he did after losing that game right. to the pirates he he was he was not the typical Josh Passner at that press conference following the game, but you know Josh, uh, it, he needs to be able to, if not speak and broadcast negativity, be able to digest it and understand where he can improve um, as a head coach and as a manager of an operation. And I would I would advise that to any any 38 year old in any line of work. Um, what I do as a journalist, there are ways I need to improve tomorrow, next week, next year, and. You don't turn negative, but you you evaluate the the negative influences on your performance um, in trying to to get more positive and do better. Isn't it ironic that Tom Bowen comes in to try to fix football, not thinking he'd have to deal with basketball? Right. Josh wins games. He keeps the team out of trouble. There's no problems with the NCAA. Let me concentrate on football. Football turns the corner, as right. you know, the last couple of seasons, right. and now all of a sudden. A basketball problem, or at least it seems like it's a problem, is staring them right in the face. Yeah, you get the impression it's a zero-sum game that we can only have one winner at a time with the two, you know, major revenue generators at the university. And that's we know that's not the case. Um, it, it's, it's distinct irony, Greg. And I think it's, if anything, it's a it's a positive twist overall for the university as it works toward uh, the ultimate goal, I believe, of being in a Power Five conference because that's going to take football. You got to be selling football. Um, selling tickets, um, you know, being on national television. That football program is going to lead the way if Memphis is to be a member of the Big 12 or any of these major, major leagues. Um, Basketball is an easier program to turn around, I believe. You know, you get two, an easier fix. Yeah, you get two or three of the right recruits. You know, a basketball program can take off in, in, in a year. It's a harder ship to turn with that, with that football program, which makes, you know, Justin Fuente a saint in these parts, and he'll always be one. Um, but, uh, you know, Tom, I imagine, has had some nights uh, scratching his head on what exactly kind of this challenge is he took on. You mentioned realignment. That was my next question. You leave me into it perfectly. Do you think they're in position? Because we know that the Big 12, despite the decision to allow them to play a championship game with just the 10 teams, the Oklahoma president has been very adamant about needing to add a couple of teams. There's probably six, seven, eight good possibilities out there. Do you think Memphis is in a good position to be one of those teams? Absolutely. I mean, geographically, we make perfect sense. You know, you get those teams in Texas and Oklahoma and on up into Kansas. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, if you've paid any attention to college basketball outside of Memphis this year, you know the Big 12 Basketball League is, is that's, it's off the charts right. talented. And it would, it, would, it would be a game changer for fans here who would not be able to just you know, anticipate a 21 season automatically when you're facing six, seven teams that are vying for NCAA tournament bids every year. It would be a perfect fit for, for the University of Memphis. Um, and, and, 
you know, the Big 12 has to find two more teams. They call themselves the Big 12 for crying out loud. <laughs> between that and the Big 10 have with 14 right. teams. Numbers well, and they, geographies all messed these up. These are colleges. They're, they're teaching students math. They need to get this <laughs> right. And, it's, and, the, and the time is, is here. And I, I hope that, that the University of Memphis is in line for consideration by the powers that be at the Big 12. Let me switch gears. I want to get your thoughts next weekend, Super Bowl 50. Peyton Manning's more than likely last hurrah. Mm-hmm. Carolina has been a great team this year. Michael Orr, a Memphian, will play in his second Super Bowl. Right. What does Frank Murtaugh think of the Super Bowl? You know, whoever wins Super Bowl 50 is going to be a champion we remember. You know, it's going to be Peyton Manning's swan song, his Hollywood ending right along the lines of his, his boss, John Elway, 17 years ago. Good point. Or you're going to have the, these Panthers. And, Greg, only two NFL teams have finished an 18-1 season and won the Super Bowl. That was the 84-49ers and the 85 Chicago Bears. you got to go back you know, 30 years. If the Carolina Panthers pulled this off, they have gone from being a, a, you know, a new franchise, just 20 years old, right. to being in the conversation among the greatest teams, single-season teams in NFL history. So either way, you've got a compelling uh, Super Bowl matchup that um, you know, kind of pulls your heartstrings in, in two different directions. The, the generational gap between Peyton Manning and Cam Newton, mm-hmm. these two stellar defenses that may steal the show from either of the quarterbacks, I, I think it's going to be a... A great uh, golden anniversary for the Super Bowl. And Monday morning quarterbacking will be very interesting, especially if Peyton doesn't get a win. What do they think of the legacy? Does it take a hit right. because he would be one and three in Super Bowls? Or if he gets the win, conversely, two and two, right. it's a lot better winning two than only winning one. Huge difference. And, and I know, I, I got to believe Peyton feels this and his family feels this, but I also think in the big picture uh, down the road, Dan Marino is a great, great quarterback. He's on many folks, Mount Rushmore, great quarterback. he never won. Never won a Super Bowl. Frank, that takes you off the hot seat, but we like to end all our interviews with something called, called Five for the Road. Quick answers, simple questions. People can learn a little bit more about you. What's your favorite professional sports team? St. Louis Cardinals. I'm a third-generation Cardinal fan. Uh, learned to, to root for the Cardinals. Uh, Lou Brock, Ted Simmons at my, my dad's side, and to this day. I know you love baseball, and stay tuned. We're going to hear from Stephen Piscotty and Michael Waka coming up on overtime. Favorite pro athlete? Ozzie Smith. Ozzie Smith, bar none. He did everything on a baseball field that I could not do. <laughs> you can't do that somersault? No, no. I could catch a fly ball. That's, that's about it. Favorite movie of all time? Doesn't have to be a sports movie. Yeah, um, well, we lost Abe Vigoda this week, so we did. I go with The Godfather. Oh, you know, the, there you go. The life lessons from the Corleone family. Great trilogy, uh, especially one, but two also won an Academy Award. Favorite movie, uh, favorite um, television show of all time? We will go with NYPD Blue. If I could not, if I were not a journalist, I would want to be a detective like Bobby Simone. Uh, big heart, tough guy, NYPD Blue. And then you get to hang with Kim Delaney. I wouldn't mind that either. Not too shabby. I wouldn't mind that either. Favorite music, Frank? Oh, I, I have been a member of the Kiss Army since I was in third grade. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, it's Kiss and Van Halen, ACDC, Led Zeppelin. I'm a rocker. 70s, 80s rock and roll. Yeah, hard rock and roll. Frank, right. it's a pleasure, man. Thanks, Greg. Thank you it's so much. It's a real much. honor to be here. Great stuff. Check them out. Memphis Flyers have been doing it well for 15 years and probably a, another 30 from Frank Bertoff at the Flyer. We'll take a break. Overtime is next. Believe it or not, pitchers and catchers report to spring training in about three weeks, which no doubt makes huge baseball fan Frank Murtaugh a happy camper. Recently, the St. Louis Cardinals caravan made a stop at AutoZone Park, and on hand were a couple of former Memphis Redbirds, Michael Waka and Stephen Piscotti. In 2015, Waka made his first Major League Baseball All-Star team, and Piscotti turned his first call up to the big leagues into a starting job in the Cardinals outfield. The duo also happened to be former guests of mine on Sports Files. And while I like to take credit for their success, I simply cannot. Of course, I can't. But it was great to catch up with two of the Cardinals' rising stars. I think uh, when you're with a team that you've you've been with in the minor leagues before um, for a few years, I think it just makes it that much more special. And... uh, 
you know, when when we're in the clubhouse in the minor leagues, you know, the Cardinal game is on, and you're watching your buddies who have gotten that call and get that get that chance, and a lot of them have that memorable game, and you always you want that, and so it, it just fires you up, and it's just a really cool thing to, to I think you know grow your players from within. It's a comforting thing to be, to be surrounded by guys that one you know, and two um, you know are just you know, great human beings and um, great competitors. And um, when I got called up to Chicago and uh, for my first game, you know, when I got to the locker room, I wasn't quite in, in that shock and awe phase because I had been around you know, the guys in spring training the past two um, spring trainings, and so that really kind of took a little bit of the pressure off, I think, because I, you know, I felt comfortable around um, the coaches and the players, and um, that, that that definitely helped. So going into spring, you know, I, that's probably going to be um, another thing that helps me, you know, get settled in quick and get down to work. There's so many good hitters on the team, um, and it's it's just kind of there's almost a little bit of inner competition because you want to be in the lineup. Um, but uh, no, I don't think it, it adds any pressure whatsoever. Baseball is all about adjustments, and um, I, I was kind of anticipating getting um, maybe some different looks from pitchers as as I was in the, the big leagues for two and a half months, I guess. And uh, there's nothing I could really pick up on, so it's just gonna. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm, I pride myself in being able to make adjustments, so if I see that I'm getting beat in a certain way, you know, I'm going to be attentive to that. You know, with everything going on, you know, hopefully you know, the, the fan base in, in St. Louis for the Cardinals is even stronger, but uh, um, you know, that's all kind of political stuff, and I, I don't really focus on it. What was your welcome to the big league moment? Striking out with the bases loaded on a pitch that hit me. <laughs> um, you know, it was uh, my first at bat was it was so fast. Everything was just um, it was kind of a blur, and uh, I was I knew going in that I was going to be aggressive, and I was, but maybe too aggressive. And uh, uh, it's it's funny to look back on now. It's a good story, but uh, that probably was was the first moment. Can we start off the same question I asked Stephen about being back here and the, the fond memories of Memphis? Oh, I mean, it's great coming back here. Uh, you know, I had a, had a great time uh, pitching here. It wasn't for very long, but I, I definitely enjoyed my time here in Memphis. The fans were were great, and, uh, you know, it's, it's cool coming back, seeing the new renovated stadium and seeing all the changes that they've done. It's, uh, it's pretty fun to see. The team was playing great all season, uh, but, you know, myself, I was able to make the all-star team, and, uh, you know, go out there to Cincinnati, and you know that was a great experience. I loved loved being out there, and uh, you know it was an honor getting selected to that. But you know, as a team, you know, 100 wins, making the postseason. Obviously, we didn't get where we wanted it to be, but uh, overall, it was it was a lot of fun this season. You know, playing with Wong and uh, you know Lions and Manus and Seagrass and you know pretty much the core group of those guys in the minor leagues, uh, you know, getting to play with those guys in the big leagues. You already have that connection of playing, you know, the past couple years or so together. And so that's only only a little head start for you. Uh, and so it's a, it's always fun. You know, these guys are like brothers to me now. And it's, it's a lot of fun going up to the field every day and getting to see these guys and hang out with them. Unfortunately, we're not going to have Lance Lynn with us this year. Uh, but, you know, I think picking up Leak and having Wayne Wright back in the rotation, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about this season and excited excited how it could go. But, uh, you know, it seems like every year, whether it's an injury or what, whatever, whatever we need to have picked up, it seems like someone's always stepped up and taken that upon themselves to, you know, perform. Baseball, it, it starts, with, starts with the guy on the mound. And so uh, if that guy's out there pounding the strike zone, uh, you know, getting quick outs, uh, you know, keeping a good pace to the game and, you know, doing their job on the mound, it, it tends to lead to success, and so that's always been our our bread and butter uh, with the Cardinals is going out there and pitching. But uh, it we we've had we've had some great lineups this past past years as well that I've been with them, and so it's it's not too bad having some run support out there as well. It's, it's always been a lot of fun, but even with these uh, new uh, guys that they've acquired, uh, you know I think it's it's going to be just add to the intensity, uh, add to the excitement to the game, and so. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's going to be a very tough NL Central again with the Cubs and the Pirates and the 
and the Brewers and Reds and uh, you know just a uh, it's gonna be a fun season not only against the Cubs but the rest of the rest of the rest of the Central as well. Hey, it's big week coming up in the world of sports. National signing day is Wednesday, and that means the first signing class for first year Memphis Tigers head football coach Mike Norvell. And next Sunday, it's Super Bowl 50 as the Broncos meet the Panthers. Plenty of local flavor with Memphis and Michael Orr headed to his second big game and first with Carolina. And Denver quarterback Peyton Manning, the former UT Vol star, set to play in his fourth Super Bowl and very likely the last game of his career. Next week on the program, we'll get you revved up for the game with our Super Bowl special. Until then, have a great week and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard-to-find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files.